Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Corinne Holmes. I am a director here at SMART Policy Works. Before we get started, for those who are joining us on Zoom, I'm going to ask you to please make sure your microphones are on mute. Here at SMART Policy Works, our mission is to reduce barriers and enhance systems and services for our vulnerable populations. We do this through our collaborations with organizations such as yourselves and through our trainings. This webinar series is designed to provide case managers and those who have first interactions with justice involved veterans pre and post release with information on veteran specific resources and benefits. Today's webinar topic is employment and education resources for justice involved veterans. Our presenter this morning is Kevin Howell. He is a homeless veteran outreach coordinator and Veteran Justice Involved Outreach Coordinator for the Department of Veterans Affairs in Chicago. This morning, he will be sharing information on VA employment and education benefits. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, join us this morning. Um, and at this time, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning and thanks, Corinne. Um, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present today. Uh, as Corinne mentioned, my name is Kevin Howe, and I do work at the Chicago Regional Benefit Office as part of the VBA, or Veterans Benefit Administration, which is a branch of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, also commonly known as VA. A little bit about myself. I've worked for VA for almost 10 years, and I currently serve as the Chicago Regional Office's Homeless and Justice Involved Veteran Outreach Coordinator. In this justice involved outreach role, I meet with veterans at the jails, the veteran treatment courts, state and federal correctional institutions and prisons throughout Illinois. And I try to help educate, inform, and assist these justice involved and incarcerated veterans with as much VA benefits information as possible. Prior to this outreach role, I worked at VA as part of the teams that had to process and decide VA disability claims and uh, in that role, that allows me to have a very good understanding of the internal perspective of VA and how it works. I've also served in the military for over 20 years in the Navy, and that has helped me to have a better understanding of the veteran perspective. Today, I'll be providing, as Corinne mentioned, an overview of VA benefits, employment, and education resources for justice-involved veterans. And this is a very important topic and one I'm passionate about and excited to be discussing with you all today. And what we're gonna talk about is a few key topics today. Uh, we'll do an overview of the Veterans Benefit Administration, VA Service Connected Compensation, Veterans Pension, how veterans can apply for benefits, an overview of VBA education programs, an overview of the Veterans Readiness and Employment Program, also known as VRE. We'll talk about discharge upgrades, things to keep in mind when working with justice involved veterans and how to help them apply for benefits. And then we'll have some time for a question and answer session. Now, incarceration and why is this important? Incarceration uniquely affects the veteran population because their VA benefits are directly impacted. They can be interrupted, they can be suspended, they can be reduced. Uh, many don't know. Uh, some of the statistics out there, more than 180,000 of those uh, United, those incarcerated are men and women who served in the military, over 5,000 just in Illinois themselves, and, and more than half of those justice-involved veterans have either mental health diagnosis such as PTSD, depression, anxiety, panic disorder, or they have some form of substance abuse disorder. And about 30% of these vets experience some form of homelessness, a considerable um, ratio of about five times as much as the general population. And because of this, there tends to be a knowledge gap on those community providers and others that are trying to help uh, these veterans. And so we're hoping by providing this presentation today, it will contribute towards giving some uh, information that you'll find useful when you deal with justice involved veterans. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the Veterans Benefit Administration, the branch that I, that I work for myself. Uh, its primary role is to, to oversee and control programs that provide financial and other forms of assistance to veterans, their dependents, and survivors as well. Of, 
it's one of three main divisions or branches of VA, along with the Veterans Health Administration and the National Cemetery Administration. Uh, basically, um, if it doesn't involve health care or housing, or if it doesn't involve burial and memorial, it probably falls under VBA. They're set up in 58 regional offices located throughout the US, Puerto Rico, and also the Philippines. And those are kind of like hubs within each state where a veteran can go. They can get assistance and meet with uh, VA representatives, counselors, service organizations, get letters, uh, all kinds of uh, in-person opportunities there. And the one in Chicago, excuse me, the one in Illinois is located in Chicago, downtown near the Jesse Brown VA at 2122 West Taylor Street. And that's actually where my office is out of as well. So some of the services, uh, the broad services that VBA would, uh, would utilize in helping veterans, uh, they oversee the programs involving money, disability compensation and veterans pension programs that we'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, a broad coverage of GI Bill education falls under VBA. Uh, some other education and employment programs, VRE, that we will discuss in a little bit more detail. And not just for veterans, there's something called Dependents Education and Assistance, which allows um, spouses and children of certain veterans to uh, get an education uh, under VA's programs. There's a huge home loan guarantee program, of which myself and many, many veterans have uh, taken advantage of. Um, VA life insurance is another program out there. Uh, these are great programs. They all fun, fall under the Veterans Benefit Administration. A lot of people don't know, and you might not, that uh, under the Home Loan Ver Guarantee Program, for example, a veteran can uh, purchase a home with no money down and a lower credit score. Uh, they can have a higher debt to income ratio, and they can maybe have an opportunity through this VA home loan guarantee program to purchase a house that they never thought in their wildest dreams they might be able to. Great opportunities available uh, under uh, VBA's programs. Life insurance, such as veterans group life insurance, uh, service connect disability life insurance, veterans mortgage life insurance. Uh, these are just an overview of a few things that are out there that are available to veterans that it's important for you to have just a general understanding uh, as a discussion starting point with them. Many veterans think, and this is something I come across a lot, that because they are or have been incarcerated, they don't qualify for VA benefits. And this is just not the case. As we will discuss today, justice involved veterans may still qualify for many of VA's most important benefit programs during or following incarceration. A Little bit more about VBA, they manage different programs like we talked about and, and there are some criteria, each program's a little bit different and there are some factors uh, such as these that do come into play, how long a veteran has served whether they served in wartime or peacetime can make a difference for certain programs. Are they service connected? And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Do they need a discharge upgrade? For example, uh, you'll learn that uh, for the GI Bill benefits, you must have an honorable discharge. Income and age can be criteria that also come into play. So it's, it's important as a veteran delves into this that they meet with and speak with folks who are informed in aware of some of the program variables out there. And there's a lot of experts in place uh, throughout VA and throughout other organizations to assist these veterans. So I wanna now start by moving on and talk a little bit about VA service connected compensation. So to start off, I wanna explain that there are two primary main income-based monetary programs that a veteran can, um, perhaps qualify for uh, that will allow VA to pay them a monthly amount. Uh, service connected compensation is one of them. And so what this involves is a tax-free monetary benefit paid monthly for disabilities or disability or disabilities that began in service or were made worse or aggravated because of service or presumed to be related to military service. 
To receive service-connected disability compensation, a veteran must have been discharged under other than honorable conditions. So what we're talking about here is a program in which a veteran was injured or had an illness, injury, disability disease that started in the military and carried over till after the military that VA has said, yes, this injury was responsible or it started because of the military and we have to compensate you, not just treat you, but we have to pay you for this disability every month. It's not based on income need, but on the chronic persistent long-term disabilities that VA has found are related to service. For example, if you hurt your back in service and you've been out for 10 years and you've constantly and frequently had pain and frustration and difficulties related to that back, uh, VA may be able to tie that to service and then they'll determine how severe is your back. And depending on how severe it is, Disability can rate from 0%, which means VA recognize there's a disability, but it's not severe enough to where they're even allowed to pay you for it yet, all the way up to 100% service connection in which a veteran, as you can see down on the screen if you're looking, a veteran might be able to earn over 3,000 a month tax-free. And so most of the veterans fall somewhere in between, uh, zero and 100%. Um, and that's how service connection um, may be able to come into play to help veterans who have been injured at some point while in service. Compensation claims can be filed while incarcerated. So how does, how does service connection come into play with justice involved veterans? Well, veterans are able to file a claim and that's how these disabilities get started is by filing a claim with VA, but there can be some challenges while incarcerated. And primarily that's because most VA uh, compensation claims require an examination so that they can meet with a, a VA doctor to learn some of the important details of the severity of the disability, um, how, how the issues may affect you, that particular part and the rest of your body, et cetera. But often it's difficult to work out the logistics of moving and restricting access, uh, getting availability to these veterans while they are incarcerated to be able to try to help them out and get them an exam. If VA is able to, to grant a claim that a veteran files from um, within uh, an incarcerated veteran without having to do an exam, they will do so, but many times it's not possible. And this has been a sticking point of frustration and challenge for both VA and these justice involved veterans. So right now VA is involved in a significant collaboration project with both state and federal prisons to improve access for in incarcerated veterans so that exams can be done. Can we get, uh, can we bring in a contract examiner? Can we train some of the prison examiners to be able to do these exams? Can we bring in VA doctors? So those are some of the things that are being worked out behind the scenes right now, all to make sure that these incarcerated veterans are able to get every single thing that they're entitled to uh, from VA. So how does incarceration impact veterans who are already service connected? So if a veteran is convicted of a misdemeanor, they're gonna receive their full service connected compensation benefits while incarcerated. Misdemeanor convictions will not affect the pay that they receive. However, if it's a felony conviction, it will after a certain amount of time. Service connection must be reduced to 10% disability pay effective on day 61 for all incarceration periods lasting longer than 60 days. So what that means is is the first 60 days of a felony conviction where a veteran is incarcerated following that conviction, they're gonna get their full disability pay of say it was 100%, the example we showed earlier, that would be over 3000 a month. On day 61, effective that day, the veteran's service connection will be reduced to 10%, which is a little over $140 a month. So that's a big, big difference almost 3,000 a month reduction in pay, which can be very, very challenging if that veteran happened to have been the primary wage earner 
for a family prior to them being incarcerated. So the good news is all are part of compensation that's not paid to a veteran while they're incarcerated may be apportioned to that veteran's spouse, children, or dependent parent. So for an example that I just gave of 100% down to six, excuse me, 10%, there's almost a $3,000 difference in pay. If it can be shown that that family still needs that income in order to uh, survive, pay their bills, feed the, the family, that kind of thing, VA can apportion all of the rest of that back to them so that the family is not in a true hardship situation based on the veteran's incarceration. However, a couple of points of note, the, the dependent must file the apportionment claim and it's not automatic. VA still has to calculate and show that there is a need for that income, um, that it will help to cover living expenses, those type of things. But at least it's out there. And that's one of the main things when I meet with veterans, I work with them on is to ensure that their families uh, can work through apportionment claims to be able to get the income that they need. So let's talk a little bit about pension. The first program we spoke about was compensation, and that is things related to military injuries. Veterans pension is another monetary program that VA can pay every month to a veteran, but it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with injuries that occurred in service. It's a tax-free needs-based benefit paid to wartime era veterans with limited to no income. So if, if we've got a veteran who served during wartime, doesn't have to be in combat, but in that era, and they have very little income, little to no income, this is an opportunity to ensure that these qualified wartime veterans have some source of income. So they're not penniless, homeless, that kind of thing. Now they're not gonna get rich off it, there are some income limits, but it, you know, if you're getting $1,100 a month that you didn't have before, it certainly helps towards whatever you need to do uh, to make uh, things improve upon in your life. Um, as I mentioned before, it's not based on service-related injuries, right? but it's also not an unemployment benefit. Just because a veteran may qualify otherwise, but decides, I don't want to work, that's not necessarily going to be enough. There are some certain criteria involved in veterans pension, which again is a, a second monetary type of program that veterans are entitled to. So a few of the basic criteria with this is just like with, with compensation and pretty much all programs, they cannot have had a dishonorable discharge, had to have one day at least of wartime service. And in addition to that one day, they had to have some extra time on active duty, typically 90 days for the older veterans. And nowadays, starting in September of 1980, you got to have 24 months of active duty or have the whole time that you were maybe recalled to active duty as a guardsman or a reservist. There are some income and net worth limitations. So VA will calculate all that out. And there's some figures that have to be added on to the forms uh, from the veteran um, to determine whether or not they meet that qualification. But if they basically have some disabilities, whether they're related to, to service or not, they could have got in a major car accident 10 years after service, completely shatter most of their bones in their body, has nothing to do with service. But if it keeps them from gaining uh, a substantial uh, and sustainable income, VA will be able to pay them a pension. Uh, for veterans who are 65 or older, there is no medical or other need. If you are 65 or older, you meet the wartime and the active duty criteria, you're going to be automatically granted. And I've helped a lot of veterans that are on their way out of uh, incarceration and automatically qualify for this benefit. I've worked closely with them in VA to expedite these claims so that basically we file it 30, 45 days prior to their departure from incarceration. And by the time they get out, within a week of them getting out, those benefits are being paid to them. A little bit more about veterans pension. Um, like we said, it, it is income based. So if you make too much money, uh, you will not probably qualify for the program. 
And the biggest thing as it relates to justice involved veterans, which is really our focus today, unlike service connected compensation, pension benefits must be stopped or discontinued by VA on day 61 of incarceration following conviction, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony, because pension is needs and income based and VA looks at it as they're being housed and fed and treated medically while they're incarcerated, VA will stop the benefits at, at, on day 61 of that incarceration with pension. A little bit different than with the service connection. So with that in mind, it's very, very important that an incarcerated veteran in receipt of monetary compensation or pensions notify VA as soon as possible about their conviction and imprisonment to avoid significant potential overpayment and debts incurred to VA. Um, I, uh, I have encountered veterans, it's just a tragic story where we've been trying to work with them after the fact because they were at a very high service connection level and for whatever reasons weren't aware, didn't notify VA, it took VA an extended time to learn about their incarceration, and they ended up with a, a debt overpayment of over $100,000 to VA. Now, that's a terrible financial situation to be in as you overcome incarceration and head um, back out into the civilian world. And so there are some processes we work with them with debt management to try to, based on their hardship circumstances, get those waves. The most important point to drive home from all of this is to ensure that if you're working with veterans who are just as involved and they're already been in receipt of VA monetary benefits, let them know to notify VA as soon as possible. VA will eventually know or learn through a batch matching um, report system we share with SSA, Social Security Administration and Bureau of Prisons, but sometimes that could take many months um, and it could be even longer before VA takes an action on that. So how do we apply for benefits? Well, there are a number of ways and during this pandemic, VA has uh, definitely helped to streamline the process by um, doing a lot of online movement and um, uh, ease of filing electronically. Um, so va.gov www.va.gov is the primary hub where all of VA channels and focuses are now being resourced in the not too far off future. That will be the primary place for access to nearly all benefits. Um, I've personally filed a claim through there and helped hundreds of veterans during this pandemic to file an online claim through uh, va.gov or through ebenefits.va.gov, which is transferring into va.gov. And the reason they're able to do that is VA has basically taken the forms and the confusion out of it, where basically now a veteran is just um, following through on drop down questions. Would you like to file for this? Where have you been seen at VA? And behind the scenes, the computer is importing all of this information into the right forms and spaces. So when you click submit, it's already there. You don't have to mail anything. You don't have to fax anything. You don't have to call anyone. A great way if you're computer savvy or working with veterans who are uh, that have that option. But some people don't. And some people just aren't comfortable with computers. So you can also call VA's National Call Center at 800-827-1000, and they will assist you with filing a claim. And there's a lot of wonderfully knowledgeable, accredited service organization representatives, um, attorneys, or claims agents that are specialized, accredited, trained with and by VA to help uh, individual veterans uh, file their claims. Uh, when the pandemic is not in effect, um, the, the veterans can go to the regional office where they can meet with a VA counselor in person that can help them file, or many of them um, also have the option on their own to mail or fax a claim to VA. Everything at VA now goes to a national evidence intake center. So wherever forms, information, evidence need to be submitted to VA worldwide, they all go to the same place now. Uh, an evidence intake center in Janesville, Wisconsin. And depending on whether it's a compensation or a pension claim, will 
Um, it's still going to Janesville, but the address on the PO box would be a little bit different, but that information is provided as well. Uh, the point being lots of different options for veterans electronically, um, in person, via mail, uh, via phone, many different options and ways to help veterans to be able to file for disability benefits at this time. So let's transition and talk a little bit about VA education benefits. Another part of VBA's uh, major uh, program division to assist veterans that have served. Uh, the VA provides education benefits to service members, veterans, and even some dependents and survivors. A lot of folks might not know that. Uh, they can, veterans can receive financial support for just an incredibly diverse array of program types of studies, uh, much, much more than the old days where it basically almost required just an in-person brick and mortar college in order to qualify for benefits. We can talk about graduate, undergraduate programs that are covered ed education-wise, uh, vocational and technical training, licensing and certification for national tests, apprenticeship, non-college degrees, correspondence courses, OJT on the job training now qualifies under VA benefits, flight training, much, much more. Re really an important program that VA has invested billions of dollars in because we want to ensure our most precious commodity, those veterans and the family members and survivors that also qualify, that they can be educated, that they can achieve their goals and, uh, and training needs and VA is there to assist them through that process. So if you're watching, you can see the screen, you can see there's a number of different programs and each one is a little bit different. They have different qualification requirements. Um, I don't wanna overwhelm you with uh, a lot of details um, right now because there are education specialists that do this all day, every day that get into the nuances, uh, but I just wanna make you aware of some of them. Uh, most current VA program out there, and they've changed over time, and almost always they have improved in one way or another, whether it be the amount of, of education benefits, the amount of time that veteran can use, that type of thing. Uh, currently, we have the post-9-11 GI Bill. Um, that uh, is a great program, which was the first one to offer the potential uh, while on active duty for an individual to even allow a transfer of some of their education benefits to their family members. Uh, it had a deadline, 15 years from the release from active duty, the day that you separate from the military, that benefit expired. And so over time, uh, Congress and others said, you know what, that's not good enough. As we try to help our families, as we try to help our veterans that serve so honorably, we can do better. And so now they have something called the, the Forever GI Bill, also known as the Harry W. Colmary Veteran Ed Education Assistance Act. <laughs> That's a mouthful. But if you just think of the Forever I GI Bill, basically take that post 9-11 GI Bill concept. And instead of saying, guess what? You only have 15 years after you leave the military to use it. For those who left after January 1st, 2013, that bill is forever. You can use those education benefits if you still have them at 95 years old, or they can be passed down to other family members that can use them. Super, super impressive uh, education program, but it's not for everybody. Some of the older veterans that uh, we will encounter uh, may not be eligible for some or all of these programs. So in a moment, we're going to talk about an opportunity that still might be available to them. Um, some of the other uh, programs under VA's GI Bill education, Montgomery GI Bill, active duty. That was the one that when I joined the military uh, in the late 80s, that was the program in effect. You had to pay uh, a certain amount of money uh, for the first 12 months into the program, and then you got 36 months of benefits for that afterwards. Uh, one of the downfalls of that program is it's only good for 10 years from uh, release from active duty. So myself as, as one of those veterans no longer um, have access to that particular benefit. 
We also have um, some education programs for folks who serve in the guard or the reserves. It's not just for active duty folks. So we have the Montgomery GI Bill Selected Reserve Program. Um, you gotta have, there's, with all of these, there's some uh, important components and qualifications associated with these programs. Uh, six year obligation you gotta have in the reserves. Um, there are some, if you're called to active duty, maybe you were just in the inactive reserves and then you end up being recalled to active duty on a reserve education assistance program. Post Vietnam era programs with V, National Call to Service. Uh, those are all various programs over time that VA has used and some of them still in effect today in support of making sure our veterans can be educated, that they have the most opportunity to be successful and achieve their dreams once they leave the military. Uh, there's even something a lot of folks uh, that I encounter, uh, veterans and others aren't aware, something called survivors and dependents educational assistance or DEA program. Uh, it's a little bit limited. You have to be a veteran um, that's 100% service connected, permanent in total, uh, or have died on active duty as a related, relate of a service related injury. And that program allows uh, de uh, dependents, spouse and children of those qualified veterans to be able to go to school free of charge um, on VA's uh, budget and dime so that a, a veteran can um, can have peace of mind that may have been significantly injured is 100% knowing that his family uh, will be taken education, uh, will be taken care of education wise. Can't say enough about some of these great programs that VA offers out there. Um, the most important thing that I could recommend is to have these veterans or yourself if you have questions on which one the veteran may qualify for. Is there any entitlement? Um, there's a website online, benefits.va.gov slash GI Bill is uh, the website for those who like to go online. But if you have specific questions or confusions or just wanna talk with someone in general more, we have VA GI Bill education specialists that are also available uh, to be contacted at 1-888 GI Bill 1. So a little bit more about the education, some of the things that are covered under these programs, important to, to have an idea about. They'll cover tuition, fees for public, private, even foreign schools, licensing, testing, national exams, SATs, LSATs, MCATs, if you want to go to med school. All of those can be uh, covered costs under VA's education programs, OJT, apprenticeship training, vocational, relocating from a high, highly rural areas into an area that's more conducive to your studies. They will even compensate and pay for that. And under the post 11 GI Bill, there is a monthly housing allowance that is paid basically at... Um, it's, it's based on zip code, but it pays a housing allowance every month while in school that allows that veteran to have an additional in-pocket cash amount that helps them while they're studying. So all of these things are, are set up to help uh, these veterans um, succeed. So how does these education benefits impact incarceration? That's important as it ties into the veterans we are talking about today. Well, veterans incarcerated for other than a felony can still receive full education benefits, including those um, that are convicted felons that are now in what they call halfway houses or residential reentry uh, re centers or participating in work release programs or other means where they're considered convicted felons that are released in some form or special program uh, from the uh, correctional facility. Um, they have full benefits available to them under the GI Bill. For felony convictions, still not so bad. If otherwise already entitled to GI Bill benefits, meaning they still had to have, have had those GI Bill benefits available to them, whether they were incarcerated or not, um, 
they can still receive while incarcerated GI Bill financial aid, including uh, costs of books, equipment, supplies, fees, registration, almost everything available uh, for those who aren't incarcerated or have a misdemeanor, you can receive those same education benefits um, under felony convictions while imprisoned. The primary exception is no housing allowance is provided because they look at it um, as if you already have housing and you don't need additional money for that. Um, but other than that, please understand that these incarcerated veterans, this is a great opportunity for them to educate themselves and take advantage of, of um, self-improvement opportunities at VA expense while they're still incarcerated. A um, couple of exceptions to understand if there are state and federal programs out there that will pay all these fees occasionally for veterans. If they do, the GI Bill won't pay anything more if the veterans already had all those education costs covered by the state or by the prison or uh, some other government program. Um, but if they're partially funded and say the veteran might have to pay 5,000 out of cost of their own pocket or some other means in order to take certain classes, the GI Bill will cover all of those remaining costs. Pretty cool. So that was general education uh, and some of the ma major programs that VA offers. I want to switch to uh, something called Veterans Readiness and Employment Program, also known as VRE. Until very recently, in the last month or two, it was known by many as Vocational Rehabilitation and Employment Program. It's the same great program, um, super, super um, opportunity for many veterans, especially if they need education or other lines of improvement and they don't qualify for education benefits through other means um, that VA offers. And so with this VRE program or Veteran Re Readiness and Employment Program focuses on is helping veterans who have service-connected disabilities, Remember when we talked about compensation earlier and veterans being paid or compensated for those military related injuries, that's the concept with this. If veterans have been determined by VA to have service connected disabilities and they have barriers to employment based on those injuries that keep them from finding, gaining, accessing suitable employment, VRE is a tremendous program that's out there that will allow veterans to take advantage of some incredible things that are going to help them um, in their journey. They offer service to improve one's ability to live in as independently as possible. That's the goal. Um, there are people from individuals who just struggle with severe tinnitus that keeps them from doing technical jobs all the way to vo uh, veterans that have lost uh, all four limbs and are still trying to live as independently as possible. Everyone in between um, is uh, a candidate as well. And the main purpose is to try to help these veterans to be ready to work. It's uh, an employment program. It's managed by the VRE departments at each local regional office. In Chicago, where I work out of, there's a, a large uh, VRE department that's um, Veterans will go in and that's where they'll, they'll start the process and be assigned a counselor and begin um, to see if they qualify and how um, they're going to journey through the VRE program. To, to my opinion, it's one of VA's best keep kept secrets. So please help spread the word about this awesome program. It, in, it includes comprehensive rehabilitation evaluation um, by experienced voc rehab counselors uh, to help determine what are your abilities, your skills, your interests, your goals. So they meet with you. It's different than GI Bill in the sense that GI Bill, you just decide, I want to go to school. And you have a you, you, you fill out the paperwork, you get accepted into school, you take your classes, you pass them, BA pays for this. This is different. It's definitely a program, VRE, that could involve schooling. It could involve a lot of things, but the main focus or concept behind that is you have, you have case management. You have skilled voc rehab counselors and teams that are there to ensure every step of the way 
the planning, the needs, the requirements, the evaluations, everything you need, they are there to assist you along that journey. It, it, it's um, the end goal of this is employment and independent living, but the journey in between as a part of this program often involves, um, it could involve college, on the job training, apprenticeships, non-paid work. Um, it provides up to 48 months of education for technical schools, uh, secondary, et cetera, et cetera, even more than the GI Bill. But um, the amount of education benefits available is uh, decreased by the amount of GI Bill used. So if you're entitled to 48 months of voc rehab education or VRNE uh, readiness employment education, but you've used 36 months under the GI Bill, uh, they would basically say you qualify for an additional 12 months However, there's a lot of flexibility in this program that say the goal at the end would be for you to be a computer, um, a, com a computer programmer, because maybe you were a mechanic in the military and you hurt your back so badly, that's not possible anymore. They have authorization to allow you to succeed by covering the costs of whatever the length of the rest of your training is in order to ensure you can meet that goal of becoming a computer programmer. Uh, they have employment coordinators that at the end of the program, uh, they provide you with job seeking skills, resume development, interview practices, so that even once you've completed all of this training or other opportunities that you have, you would then sit down with this specialized rehabilitation co uh, employment coordinator that networks with private industry, state, um, federal job, individuals, groups, entities that have indicated they would like to hire and work with veterans. And so they partner and collaborate with them to help you uh, be able to uh, work in one of those options or opportunities if, if so do so. And then they train you along the way, like I said, through resumes, job skills, connections, all of that stuff. Uh, they include rehabilitation services along the way. If you need equipment, um, Say you need a computer or a laptop, uh, you need a printer, you need paper, you need maybe the school you're going to is photography and you need a camera. Those are all packaged parts as a part of the veteran readiness and employment program that are available. Super, super impressive program in my opinion. Um, there are some requirements just like with everything with uh, VA, you have to be able to complete the veterans readiness and employment program within 12 years of leaving the military or from the uh, 12 years from the date that VA notified you that you were service connected. And a lot of times that's gonna be well after. Say it was 25 years after you were uh, left the military that you were found service connected. You think I don't have any GI Bill education benefits but I can't work, my service related injuries now inhibit me to do the job that the military trained me in and I need to, to learn how to do something differently. It's a super program for those veterans that need this rehabilit rehabilitation training. They need support. They need education. They need certifications through vr &E. um, They allow them to overcome these service-related barriers, help them to get the education, the employment skills needed, and then help them to partner to be able to get a job. Few other things to note, uh, veterans must have a 20% service connected disability or 10% service connection with a serious employment handicap. All right, so there are some basic requirements, 20% service connection or 10% if there is a serious employment. Uh, how does this involve or impact incarcerated veterans? since that's the real topic we're talking about today as well. Great news, incarcerated veterans still able to apply for and remain in the VRNE program while incarcerated, and they may receive all of the services, assistance, benefits, um, support needed as a part of their vocational rehabilitation program to include testing, evaluation, tuition fees, supply, uh, supplies, employment assistance. It gets a little more challenging, albeit, uh, in terms of access, um, but they are still available and 
they partner with these um, these correctional institutions to ensure that in as much as they can offer hands-on um, support while a veteran is in the program and incarcerated, that, that VA will continue to do so. Uh, there's also for those who are not incarcerated, uh, there is a financial component aside from everything we talked about is VRE pays a subsistence allowance straight to the veteran in order to help them to, you know, have a little bit of financial assistance while they're going through this training program. And if the veteran is allowed or still has access to the nine, post 9-11 GI Bill, they can request to use the GI Bill housing allowance instead of the VRE stipend, and that will give them even more money. Um, important to note that neither of these payments are available while incarcerated, but it's important to share because a lot of these veterans will be in the VOC rehab or the, excuse me, the VRE program. And then as they transition out, they'll be eligible for these uh, allowances. So let's talk a little bit, bit about discharge status and upgrades, transitioning from the education piece to another important part of uh, veterans and their association with potential benefits. Uh, so when a veteran leaves service, they're going to have some form of character of discharge. And the ones I've got listed here are uh, the categories that will be assigned based on their service and the conditions for which they left service. Honorable is the best uh, separation characteristic, uh, excuse me, character of discharge category a veteran can get. They're eligible for everything that VA offers with an honorable discharge. Healthcare, disabilities, education, home loans, everything, the whole enchilada. A general under honorable condition is slightly lower than an honorable. And with that, they're still eligible and entitled for VA healthcare, for housing programs, home loan, um, monetary benefits such as compensation and pension. However, they're not educated, not, not eligible for the GI Bill. They still are for VRE, but not the GI Bill. So a lot of veterans that were incarcerated that may have received a general under honorable conditions, I'm encouraging and supporting them to apply for the VRE program if they need employment and they need education resources to help them with that. So I would give, in terms of a stoplight, I would give honorable and general honor conditions generally a green light. Almost everything goes. Um, a bad conduct or a dishonorable is kind of like a red light. They are not eligible. There's a statutory or mandatory bar to basically all benefits from VA with a dishonorable or bad conduct discharge unless VA is able to show clearly that insanity was involved in the impact of what brought about that character of discharge. And other than honorable, it's sort of a yellow light or a gray light in VA world. Uh, and other than honorable, it's veterans um, who, for VA purposes, they're not considered dishonorable and they're not considered honorable. And so VA will have to make a decision, a character of discharge determination, and they make it separately for both health care and for monetary benefits. And at the end, they will look at the scenario and say, can we offer benefits to this veteran with an other than honorable discharge? It's like, say for example, with dishonorable, that was very, very, very severe stuff. They've done time in uh, prison in the big house. Uh, you know, the most heinous or serious crimes that you could think of would be ones that would be that. For other than honorable, it's more of a gray area. It could have just been a pattern of misconduct. Um, sometimes it's things that you wouldn't even think they would give an other than honorable, but maybe they, um, they had a positive urinalysis or drug test, something along those lines. At times, people were separated with another than honorable uh, for uh, being homosexual at a time where that was not allowed in the military. So VA will take all of those facts and circumstances into consideration, and they will say, for VA purposes, can their service be considered honorable or can it be um, 
or must it be considered not honorable? So sometimes a veteran's not happy with any of their conditions of discharge separation other if it's not an honorable one. So there are options available to apply for a discharge upgrade. And as a part of my role in working with and supporting justice involved and other veterans, I will sometimes help them uh, along with this process as well. Now, to actually change the discharge upgrade is not a VA thing. That's a military thing. Um, when veterans separate, they receive a DD-214 form, which, uh, among other things, lists their character of discharge, their years of service, awards, et cetera. But that's controlled by the branches of service the veteran served in. And so um, with that in mind, um, there are some, some forms and some processes involved that a veteran would need to go through in order to try to get an upgrade to their discharge. If they believe there was an error or an injustice or something wrong, or maybe the law has changed, or there was unique circumstances where they felt they were harassed or uh, discriminated against or many things in between, they have a right to appeal that and request an upgraded discharge. It's a very formal process. It takes time. It does not have a real high um, overturn rate. Uh, they look at things like inequities, um, unfairness, et cetera, but they do take into consideration um, discharges that are lower than honorable and the circumstance of things like mental health. You know, was it a combat veteran that's experiencing PTSD that had good service, honorable service all the way through until after their traumatic, horrific experiences in Iraq or Afghanistan. Those are the kind of circumstances that they will take great care and consideration in looking at to determine whether or not they can um, provide an upgraded discharge to the veteran. And uh, so depending on when they separated, there's a couple of different forms. Um, one, if you serve less than, if you were separated from the military less than 15 years ago, and another one for more than 15 years. Uh, their DE form, Department of Defense forms 293 and 149. Not gonna get too technical with them, but the main point is that to encourage and, and be aware that many veterans will receive something other than an honorable discharge. And when they do, they have a right and an opportunity to uh, appeal that and request a discharge upgrade. But it is a formal military process not involving VA uh, that it's important they connect with people who are um, experienced in this process to increase their opportunities to uh, have a likely favorable outcome and an upgrade to the discharge. Kevin, um, we have only yes. about, what, five minutes left. We wanted to leave some time for questions. Perfect. I'm just wrapping it up. I have one more slide and then we will uh, leave time um, definitely for questions. Um, so I wanted to emphasize, thank you, Corinne, uh, how to resume VA benefits. So super important for veterans to know that when they, when they leave incarceration, it's not an automatic benefit resumption. VA needs to know, and they need to have evidence to show that, uh, the, um, veteran is officially being released. And so, Within 30 days of separating from, um, 30 days of anticipated uh, release from incarceration, a veteran should notify VA and provide them with any written documentation from the official um, prison notification or a parole board. And VA will resume uh, those benefits in full as of, effective as of the date of release. Provided a veteran, a VA is known, notified within one year of release from incarceration. So they have a whole year and VA will back pay them to the day they leave. If they don't, if they wait, which definitely not to their advantage, VA can only start those benefits effective as is the date they receive notice. There's no required or prescribed form to submit. You can call VA at their national call center. Um, you can write into VA. The most important thing is to be able to provide evidence officially that you've been released, because if you don't, VA will have to request that prior to resuming your benefits. They'll have to request it from uh, the correctional facility you're at, and that will delay benefit resumption. 
Um, things just to keep in mind. One last slide. When working with justice involved veterans, uh, and I put this in there because it's something that I've seen over and over again that's very important. Many incarcerated veterans struggle with this incarceration stigma. They really no longer believe true of true in their hearts that they're deserving of any VA benefits that we talked about from monetary to education to employment, everything in between. They feel like they've blown it and they don't deserve it anymore. It's important for all of us to remind them. You know, I say this all the time, listen, you took the oath. You stood the watch in uniform. You signed a blank paycheck up to including your, your life to support and defend our country. So on behalf of a grateful nation, believe me, it's VA's great honor to provide them with all the benefits that they have earned, they're truly deserving of. And if we can emphasize to that and encourage them to continue to learn about and um, apply for and take advantage of these benefits, I think um, it's not only exactly what VA would want, it's what we'd all want and it's what the country would want for them. So with that in mind, um, we're right about on time and I just wanted to open it up for any questions that might be out there. And hopefully this was able to provide a little bit of information and um, assistance that, that's provided some help uh, to those working with Justice Involved Veterans today. Thank you very much. Wow, Kevin, thank you so much for all that wonderful information on the education and employment um, resources for veterans, especially, specifically Justice Involved Veterans. We did have a, a couple of questions that were posed on Facebook, so I wanted to make sure that we um, those questions were uh, answered. The first one is, how do eligible veterans typically start their service-connected compensation? Is it usually part of their discharge process if they've been injured in service, or is it common for it to happen much later? Uh, that's a really great question, um, because the answer is both and all throughout the journey. So veterans who are leaving the military now, um, that, that has been um, streamlined and formalized in an amazing way um, that there's an entire transition process and a special program that VA partners with the military at all of our bases worldwide to begin that claims uh, filing disability process at uh, about 100 days, 180 days out from separation to the point where uh, they send in VA benefit counselors um, or representatives from service organizations that provide training, counseling, and help them to fill out the paperwork at the time. Uh, they are in the process of starting to transition out. And the goal is instead of doing like a final exam through the military, VA takes care of all of that so that in, in a perfect situation, uh, the veterans transition out of the military and receive their final paycheck. And the next month, uh, the VA's already made a decision. They've got everything they need. And the veteran will start picking up with the paycheck from uh, the Veterans Affairs for any disability. Um, Post-service, uh, there's no time limit. Uh, I've worked with World War II veterans. I've worked with Vietnam veterans. Uh, I've worked with folks who just left service uh, a month or two ago. And everyone in between, um, the goal is there is no required timeline. Uh, there are a lot of changes in movements and forms that are now required with uh, VA. Uh, when I first started, we could accept a claim on anything. My first claim I ever worked on was one that was about a five foot roll of toilet paper that I was trying to figure out what are they claiming, but we accepted it then. The point being now get with someone who is um, familiar with the VA process to make sure you're doing it right but file, file, file. Hopefully that answered the question. Corinne, are there any other yeah, ones yeah, out there? There's one more question. Um, can the veteran start to apply uh, VR and E while incarcerated? Yes, it's less likely and it's a little bit more challenging um, to do so, uh, typically because the VRNE process um, starts with an orientation in which you meet one-on-one -on -one individually with 
the voc rehab team, excuse me, the VRNE a veterans readiness team and their coordinators and meet face to face to start the process. Um, but uh, they, they are in, entitled to, uh, they are allowed to, and I would encourage them still to uh, file for VRNE while incarcerated. Uh, it may be a little less traditional and VA is working very closely with the Bureau of Prisons in the States to try to find a way to make it work. And they are encouraging, it's encouraging to see their willingness to support. Um, I go in on a frequent basis uh, to a lot of these prisons and I go in with our, our VHA, our Veterans Health Administration partners. And once I did go in with a VRNE counselor as well, and we were able to get everything done for them right at the spot. So definitely while incarcerated, they can still apply and stay in the program. And I would strongly encourage them to support those wanting to do so. Hi, Kevin. This is Zach here. There are two more questions that came through real fast. Uh, one sure. was, how and where do they apply while incarcerated for what you were just speaking of? And can a family member apply on behalf of the incarcerated veteran? Okay. So um, if they have access to a, that's a great question, if they have access to a computer, which is limited while incarcerated, but sometimes they, they do, a veteran can apply through www.va.gov. And the benefit of that, if they have access through their computer resource area, some of the prisons and jails I've been um, support veterans in being able and other incarcerated individuals do that. If they can apply online, it would be the easiest because there's no forms required to be printed and mailed or faxed. It's an electronic signature. Everything is populated uh, for the information, the way VA needs it behind the scenes. And uh, it's, an, it's an easy opportunity. If the veteran does not have computer access, um, they would need to uh, mail those claims to the Janesville Evidence Intake uh, Center. And um, that information is readily available online. It's a part of these slides that I can make uh, available to um, Corinne and, and others as well. So that information is there, but um, so they would either send in to VA's National Evidence Intake Center or they could do it online. Either one would be great. Um, unfortunately, a family member could not um, submit a claim on behalf of a veteran unless they happen to have already been an accredited veteran service uh, officer or um, attorney or, or um, client manager that VA has um, approved and um, already um, established as a uh, power of attorney on behalf of VA benefits for them. Uh, but a family member or a spouse could and would need to apply for those apportionment benefits that we talked about earlier. Great questions. Um, at this time for uh, participants who have joined us on Zoom, if you have any questions, if you could just raise your hand, we can unmute you. And while we're uh, waiting to see if there's anybody on Zoom that has any questions, uh, Kevin, I did have um, um, a question. When it comes to um, the actual, you had talked about veterans pension and I was curious, yes. Is there a standard amount that a veteran who qualifies would receive, or does it vary from veteran to veteran? For pension? Yes. Uh, it's th that's a really good question because um, it could be different for every veteran. So there's a maximum amount, and and at this time it's a little more than eleven hundred and forty dollars a month. So if a veteran had no income and they qualified for veterans pension, they would get a little more than 1140 a month. And if they had dependents that also did not have income, it could go up uh, for each dependent. And if the veteran's condition was significant and required the aid and attendance of another, there's some additional income to where I've seen veterans receive over 2000 a month in pension, um, which is a great amount uh, to help um, divert homelessness and other things when you have no money coming in. Um, so uh, that would be the maximum, but it is income based. So 
say if a veteran uh, was receiving a maximum because they had no money and then all of a sudden they became um, 62 and they were qualified for social security benefits. And just an example, uh, they received, started receiving 500 a month in social security benefits. VA would need to reduce their pension by that $500 dollar for dollar. So instead of 1150, say they would start to get 650 from VA in their pension and the additional 500 from social security so that they would still be right about at the maximum pension amount. Um, so uh, it, if a veteran receives some income, VA will take that into consideration. And Kevin, how- if receives some income, VA will take that and may have to reduce the dependence and severity of condition. There's some, uh, optional additional income you can play Great. can pay and um where can uh, someone find information on income limits for instance a 70 year old veteran um, who needs um a pension like where where can they find information on the um the actual income limits so they can start through uh and i would channel everyone to start through www.va.gov now that's really our hub and our center point for almost everything. And then typically um, there will be tabs and it will say basically questions about compensation, education, pension. And so that will take you to their dedicated website for each benefit um, from that va.gov site. But I wanna kind of promote and push that because that's what VA is doing and it's gonna make it super streamlined. When I first joined, there was over 40 different VA websites that you had to try to go to, and those were official US Department of Veteran ones. And now we've essentially streamlined all of them under that umbrella with links from there to the topic or the program of VA interest that you have. Great, thank you so much for oh, answering all My of those genuine questions. pleasure. Um, Any so other? I think that pretty much takes care of the questions that were posed to us. Um, I wanted to, you know, again, thank you, Kevin, for taking time to uh, share all of your knowledge and this information with us.